What's up Tube Tube? This video might be a little bit off brand from my regular content but um, I do like snowboarding I do like camping I do maybe potentially like camping in the snow so this is gonna hopefully help me in that situation. So, this is a diesel heater. Now, I've got a camper van and I've wanted to put one of these into my camper van ever since I got it. Uh, and I'm keen to actually take my camper van down to the snow this season. It's almost snow, like it's, we're almost there. We are. Are we there? We're there. We're there. We're in snow season right now. So I'm keen to set this up in my camper. And I just thought, well, I want to unbox it and video it for the tubes. And I know that there's a lot of information on YouTube about these diesel heaters. And maybe there's information out there that's going to be useful, but I wanted to at least film my journey with this. So I'm starting with the unboxing. This is the fuel tank. Now it's quite a slim tank, which is good because where I want to mount it is is uh, a slim area. So, so hopefully it's going to fit in there. So it's like 70 mils, 68 even, 68 mils wide. So if you're mounting it behind a spare tire or something like that, that's something you want to measure up and keep in mind because I think that might just squeeze in between the camper and the spare tire. So I'm going to get that out of the way and we'll see what else is in this box. Alright there is an operating instruction manual there. I'll be looking at that but I've heard it's not much use. It's kind of uh, a bit broken Englishy. That's a mounting plate. Uh, this should be pre-punched for the exhaust port, the inlet port, the fuel and the wiring. So that's handy. Let's see what else. The packing on this is quite good. It came pretty well packed in um, this big box with styrofoam and all sorts of bits to... I'm just going to take that box out. That box does seem sound a bit loose when I, when I took it out. Alright, here is the actual heater. And of course, I got the carbon fibre model, didn't I? I had to. It's only, it's, it's faux carbon, but, but um, those who know me know I don't mind a bit of carbon. Uh, okay, so we've got the fuel pump there. Pop that out. This is the LCD display module and a remote control. And then the actual diesel heater itself. Alright, I'll pop that out and we'll get rid of this box. Alright. Got the unit out. Got the controller and the panel. The fuel pump. There was a little bit of um, diesel or some sort of fluid in the uh, inside of this inlet of the pump. I think that might be there from QC in the factory or it could also be just a little bit so that you don't dry start the pump uh, just a little bit to 
to uh, get it going, although I will make sure it's primed before I start it up anyway. But um, I did clean that off because it was kind of seeping out. A little bit of diesel, let's see what else we've got. I'll just move these things out of the way. There was this other box here. So I assume that we're going to have all the other components in here. Now this box doesn't have the uh, polystyrene packing that the other box had, but I'd say most of these components don't really need protection, but they're just sort of rattling around loosey-goosey in there. Uh, we got fuel hose, we've got a wiring loom, got a selection of hose clamps and cable ties. A dip tube for the tank, uh, that's the air intake filter, that is the exhaust muffler, there's a T-piece uh, which is for the for the air outlet which is cool because um, I was thinking I might have to actually buy one of those. If you are actually planning on ducting two, two locations, there's a split, a T-piece splitter there. Handy. This is the exhaust pipe. And then you've got two plastic ducts. Obviously, because you got your T piece, you got two. And then there is two lengths of large pipe, um, aluminium foil type, flexible, that'll be for your air outlet, and there is one smaller version of that, which would be for your air inlet, which is where your that bit piece will go on. There is also another piece of fuel hose in here, uh, this one is the ru rubber variety, oh, this one looks like it's nylon. Um, I believe this is to go in here so that you clamp that onto that so that you can join bits together for your joiners. Awesome, I kind of considered why wouldn't I just run the whole thing with this kind of fuel hose, but um, research tells me that the inner diameter of this hose is important to the fuel pump. So you want to have the same small inner diameter so that the pump doesn't have to uh, labor as much to fill that hose when it is in operation. All right, that is a lot of gear. Um, I do like that it came with this dip tube as well because uh, I was hoping to use the dip tube on the on the tank. That's for the tank. Uh, the idea of this is that that is at the top of your tank and you'll straighten this this uh, tube out so that it runs down into the bottom of the tank so that you don't have to drill a hole in the bottom of the tank when you fit this. I'd prefer to have the hole at the top of the tank rather than having it at the bottom because if the seals go on your uh, on your connection to the bottom then you'll have diesel leaking out the bottom whereas if you use a dip tube and your hole is at the top of the tank then uh, even if the seals wear out at the top you're not really going to leak because you're not tipping the tank upside down if that makes sense all right this all looks very good i would like to get this installed in my camper van. Oh, I just opened the, the tank and there is actually a nipple inside the tank as well. If you did want to drill a hole in the bottom and do it that way, you can still do it that way. The nipple is provided for that as well, but I will be doing it the other way for reasons just spoken. Okay, so I've chosen this spot 
for where I'm going to put my diesel heater. And I've done some measurements and I've just put a pilot hole in there and I have left the drill bit in there just so I can double check that I'm going to be uh, good for clearances on the bottom as well. Alright, so there's my pilot hole drill so I can see I've got plenty of room. I only need like 100 mils, uh, but I've got plenty of room there before I hole saw. Um, this wood's a bit chatty too, so probably uh, put some sealer or something on that as well. Alright, so I've just driven my 100 mil hole saw through the floor here. Nothing more daunting than uh, punching a 100 mil hole through the floor of your camper. Uh, make sure you absolutely 100% measure everything before you cut because uh, yeah, you don't want to get it in the wrong spot. Fortunately, as, uh, as I said, I've measured it all out and we're all good. We're in the perfect spot there. Um, all right, let's uh, just offer everything up and I'm going to run my duct out here. Now it's going to be a bit of a tight uh, spot. I don't want my winch to be in the way, but like I've worked out that if I if I get the angle right, the nozzle uh, of the duct is going to clear this, clear the winch, and then I'll be able to run it down this side here. One of the things everyone always says when installing these is that uh, you should get your um, get your plate on and then bolt yourself on and, and clamp on your exhaust and your inlet pipes and run your wires and everything. Get that all through first before you pop it through the floor because if you're doing your hose clamps up here on the bench it's much easier than having to crawl under the underneath the camper to do these clamps up on these um sounds like good advice so i'll be doing that uh it's worth noting this is the inlet and that's the exhaust um you can tell the inlet because you've got your wiring hole and your fuel pipe hole right close to it you want to keep all that stuff away from the exhaust obviously that's the exhaust that's the inlet uh, a lot of people uh, don't really understand how these heaters work and they think, oh, diesel heater, I don't want diesel fumes inside my caravan, which is true, you don't. But um, people don't really understand the way that the uh, thing works. Obviously it burns diesel, but the exhaust and everything, you seal this plate um, onto, you know, onto your hole here and... You have your exhaust pipe coming out and running to the outside. Uh, so theoretically, you shouldn't be having any fumes of anything, any fumes of any sort inside the cabin. It's just fresh air from the cabin uh, running in through the uh, heat sinks, the heat exchanger, and then out into your... So it's just your cabin air that you're sucking in, heating up. and Kind of like the way your car heater works. You don't actually heat your car off of your exhaust of your engine. Your exhaust is running out the back of the car, but you're using the engine heat through a heat exchanger to blow hot air into your cabin. Same sort of thing here. You're using the engine heat to blow hot air through your cabin, but you're not blowing the exhaust in. A bit different to like a gas heater where you're actually burning the propane or the gas inside your cabin with you. So this is actually, uh, it's all combustion's internal and exhaust is external. So you don't have any uh, fumes or anything from this. So the kit does come with a fairly comprehensive set of uh, hardware, screws, cable ties, clamps, all that sort of stuff. So far I haven't needed to provide any of my own gear, except I think the location I've chosen, I might probably need to extend the... Um, the power harness at least to get to my power but um, we'll see how we go with that I uh, may also extend uh, the, the harness where I want to put the remote control unit this one here uh, just in case 
I want to mount it uh, a bit further away from the unit. Probably not going to hurt just to put a little bit of blue Loctite on on these studs as well. Just, just in case. You know, you don't want them rattling loose. I don't want them glued in forever, but I don't want them rattling loose either. And, um, I'm just using the old two nuts trick to get a bit of purchase on that stud when I'm putting it in. I'm just putting it in my hand. Doesn't need to be that tight. Alright, so, now that i got the studs in, got them loctited nice and solid in there, I've got the plate here, the floor mounting plate. Um, at this point, it's a good idea to connect up your um, wiring loom and run your injector plug through the hole for the intake and down into that little slot there and pull it through all the way through to a point where that loom's going to probably sit something like that because if you don't do it now you're going to have a hard time getting that plug through that hole once it's bolted up and um, you can you can always cut it off and re-terminate it uh, but <laughs> it's probably uh, save you a bit of time put it through now then do your nuts up on these and then you don't have to re-terminate it just remember, it is the intake side with this. That's exhaust, that's intake. Got all the bits clamped on the bottom now. I'm going to do a test fit. Drop all the bits down the hole. Now from this angle it may look like uh, I don't have enough space for my winch for the um, air outlet but trust me I do uh, I don't know the camera angle might look like it's a bit tight there but there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh, gap there for the winch cable it's not gonna foul I've checked all right, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to mark out these floor plate locations there. Uh, and I think I will uh, cut away the vinyl from the top. I'm not sure if this is uh, necessary, but um, a lot of people have said that the base plate can get quite warm and... Uh, Vinyl warm. Uh, look, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cut it away just to be safe. And just another trial fit here. Well, 
I'll bleep till your mom. And as I was saying before, if you were concerned about the uh, the winch, you can see there's plenty of clearance under there and plenty of clearance here. All right, so I've um, put some sealant under here, put the plate back down again. Now I'm just gonna fix it down with the supplied screws. <laughs> Now you may have noticed this here, given that this is the inlet of the unit and um, I'm having it fairly hard up against the wall there, I have actually um, put a vent in there. You can see it here from the other side. Um, I just, it, that may not be necessary in your situation, but uh, I've just put it in there just to make sure there's adequate airflow. Uh, into the unit Bit of a look outside now See what it's like underneath So you can see here I did actually spray this whole area with like a um, a rubber sealant just because this area here is um, It's actually behind the the wheels so all the dirt and mud and stuff and rocks gets kicked up so this area of the wood panelling was, it had copped quite a bit. So I'm thinking of actually probably installing like a, a plate here, like a little shield, just to just to stop any uh, debris from getting up in here and hitting these bits. Not that it matters that much, they should be pretty solid, but, um, but uh, yeah, every bit counts, I think. I'm gonna run this one along that way. And then the exhaust out the back. Alright, so I've got this all tucked away now. I've run the duct down here to here. I've also run another duct over here. Uh, so I've got two. That's not strictly necessary and I did have to buy some additional duct to get that to work, but um, you could get by with just one duct, you don't need the two. I just put two in because um, my missus was concerned when this is uh, set up as a bed, if a, if a blanket was to fall down and, and block one of the vents, I set the other one up as like a fail safe, so if one vent did get blocked, it's it's got another vent or something. I don't know if that's necessary, but that's what I did. Um, I don't know if you can hear, but the rain has has come just in time for me to do the outside portion of the van, so that's awesome. <laughs> Such is life. Alright, for the wiring, uh, all I've needed to do, because all the loom that it comes with is uh, pre-prepped and everything, all I've needed to do is run a power wire. Now, the, the power wire that came with the kit was um, sufficient if you're going to mount your unit real close to your, to your battery, but because I mounted mine all the way over there, like down the other end, literal the opposite end of the, the camber from where my power supply is, I've run power uh, back to here, so I've, I've just run it around behind the cupboards and whatnot. I've run it into my power supply unit here because uh, you know Jaco have provided me with a um, eight eight load distribution 10 amps per load um, DC power supply here it makes sense to me only like only two of the only two of the loads are actually used so it's got I think they're the indoor lights and the outdoor lights uh, 
And they're the only two things that were actually used in this. So it makes sense. I've got a fused protected distribution block here. Um, I'm going to plug into that and use one of these loads. I've used number number six uh, for what it's worth. It doesn't really matter. But um, you can connect positive and negative directly to the battery if you want to do that. Um, I know from doing a bit of research that, that these things, when they are running at their hottest, and when I say their hottest, I mean when the glow plug's drawing the highest current, 10 amps is about what they pull. So these, this, this thing will be able to provide 10 amps, no problem, plus you've got the battery there. Uh, to me, I just feel like that's a, that's a decent option, especially because it gives me the option to run it off the DC even if the battery's not connected. So I can take the battery out of the van and run it just off the DC power supply unit. Completely up to you. Some people like to connect it directly to the battery. Just to me, it seems like, yeah, it seems like you've, you've got a wasted opportunity here. But people have got their views and opinions on that. I like I've I've chosen to to go this way. You can connect it directly to the battery. It's just super simple. Red to positive, black to negative. Um, yeah, could couldn't be easier to wire. There's, there's the wiring. The hardest part of the wiring for me was running the cable around the back of the cupboards and everything. And even that, when I found out you could take all the cupboards out and access the the wiring gaps behind there, it's actually pretty easy in this particular camper. So. Yeah, simple as that. That's nice and easy. Um, I'll show you where I've plugged it in. It's a bit of a rat's nest in there, but yeah, it is what it is. All right, so in the power supply here, you've just got a bunch of positives, a bunch of negatives here, negatives there, positives there. It's just a matter of crimping on some terminals and plug plugging the, the, the unit in. Uh, super simple. Just these spade lugs super simple it's all labeled each load has got a um, label on it negatives there positives there easy it is it is a bit of a rat's nest in there but as I said most of that comes from Jayco themselves not me so <laughs> I don't know as far as mounting the uh, control panel goes, my little dinette table here has got this bit of Velcro that I have no idea what it's there for. Uh, and so I figure, why not mount it there? Um, it saves me having to run uh, wire all the way back down around over there to where the battery is. And I can just um, have it here, sit here, and I can adjust temps and whatnot here. Yeah. I think that'll work well enough for me, and if I, if I decide that I want to change it later on, I can always rerun it. But I think that's a good spot. So I know earlier on I said that I was going to get the uh, dip tube in the top of the tank to kind of alleviate leaks or anything like that and I still stand by that statement however I found a neat little spot here where I can mount the tank uh, behind the spare tire carrier and it's just going to be a heap more convenient to run the little nipple straight out the bottom and run the run the fuel line straight down um, it is unfortunately going to have the potential for leaks but hopefully the o-rings will be good enough that um, they should seal up and we'll just have to keep an eye on them and maintain them make sure that they don't start to leak but it's going to be heaps more convenient uh, running the line down there for where I've chosen to put the tank I was originally going to put the tank in the front but I changed my mind because this one seemed like a neater solution all right I'm just going to drill a seven and a half mil hole in here just be aware, um, some of the videos I saw online had different size holes, so uh, make sure you measure your nipple before you do any drilling. 
Right, now that I've got my hole drilled in there, I've got a bit of fencing wire here or some sort of wire. It's just small enough that the uh, the nipple can slide on it. And I've got my tank just sort of loosely positioned here. It's not actually bolted up yet, so it's a bit loose. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to poke my fencing wire up. Through here and out the spout. All right. We've just got the wire poking out the top. Um, I start from the small hole and aim for the bigger hole. Makes it a bit easier that way. I'm just going to pop my O ring over the nipple. And feed that down down the wire. Now, in theory, this should make it poke perfectly out the bottom there. Like that. All right, now. Got my other o-ring and my retaining nut here Let's do that one up from the bottom I'll get a spanner on that make it nice and tight make sure that o-ring seals I also got a knife and just sort of um, flattened the the flashing line from the molding uh, where it goes across this surface to make it a bit flatter make it as flat as possible so the o-ring's got the best hope of sealing so I figure probably the most serviceable part or the part that's going to be replaced most often is going to be this little filter so I, I've left it here where it's nice and easy to get to um, then underneath I've got my exhaust and inlet and my fuel line. You'll see I've used a little bit of blue uh, hose there. That's a bit of hose that I had. Uh, the, the little inlet, uh, the fuel pipe that goes in there seems to be a smaller diameter than, uh, than everything else. And so when I used the rubber one that was provided, it didn't, the, the little clamps couldn't clamp it quite tight enough. So I just had to go with that. I've run the fuel line and the pump down here. Now I've suspended the pump off of some, it's, it's basically attached to some, some rubber hoses that, that uh, clamp around the lines. And I did that because everyone's always complaining about how noisy that pump is uh, although in hindsight it, uh, <laughs> I don't hear it at all over the over the unit but anyway so and then the fuel line just runs back there the only thing I haven't done yet the only thing I haven't done yet is mount the exhaust uh, it's very short and I actually want it to exit on the other side so I've ordered an extension piece of this and I'm going to run it across and out the other side because this side of the camper is uh, where my awning goes so I don't want a diesel fuel in there in the alfresco uh, or fumes I should say uh, yeah and that's pretty much it all right, got my diesel tank mounted up there. Got the spare wheel back on. Got everything back together, and uh, my my new exhaust did arrive. So I ran that one, and now it comes out uh, just over there. there. There we go. Yeah, quite happy with that. One last thing that I was not happy with 
is uh, I wasn't happy with uh, the the strain being only supported by the actual hose itself and cable tires. So I've I've bolted this, fixed this solidly with the bracket to um, the chassis, but I've done it via a rubber mount. So this is all still flexible, able to absorb some of that tick, uh, but the uh, and and again I've isolated the the hard line with some rubber lines so that it doesn't transmit that through but I felt like I couldn't leave that just sort of dangling there I didn't want that hanging off of the hoses so to speak so that's nice and solid now it's still got some rubber insulation so it's not going to transmit too much tick but it is quite solidly mounted at least okay so <clears throat> I've uh, I've got my thing installed and I've traveled to the Alpine regions of Australia and because of that I'm going to set this into Alpine mode now there's a number of different controllers available and there's a plethora of videos available for what the controllers do however my controller that I've noticed is slightly different to most in that it's got blue text here where it's usually red so I'm just going to quickly run through some of the features that um, that this one has uh, as I understand it now this circle with the cross through it denotes that it is off so it's not turned on at the moment um, the little battery symbol I believe means that it's got battery power and this is the voltage that it's measuring on that battery I'm not a hundred percent sure about this symbol but I think that's the temperature sensor for the inside uh, body of the actual um, unit now up here it is a pretty cold day uh, this this day is five degrees it's measuring inside this caravan um, so I want to heat it up a bit but before I do that I just want to go through a couple more features um, I'm going to put it in Alpine mode because we are in Alpine area so um, that Alpine mode is activated by holding these two buttons on the side the little cog and the OK hold them both down for two seconds and you'll get a little mountain so you're in alpine mode alpine mode adjusts the air fuel ratio for the uh, lack of oxygen above 2000 feet uh, so if you are above 2000 feet they recommend you put it into alpine mode otherwise you will be running too rich um, some people also use alpine mode to save fuel but um, be careful with that because if you run it uh, too lean then you can potentially get it too hot but you know you do you all right on uh, the other side here we've got the up arrow down arrow and the power now to turn it on you hold the power button for two seconds but I'm not going to do that just yet because there's a couple of other little features I want to show and try so the timer function is one that uh, I think a lot of people have got confused because the old display used to have a clock. You could just set the clock and that made sense. But this one doesn't actually have a clock. So, so to activate the timer, you hold down these two buttons at the bottom and that brings up the time that you want it to come on. And you'll see in the top corner here it says on, timer on. So if you want it to come on in two hours, you go press this power button to move across to the next digit one two and then set okay 
I don't want it to come on in two hours, though. I want it to come on now. So, But I do want to use the timer feature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to the minimum, which is 0 0.01 of an hour. Like that. Now, after it turns on, if you want it to run for, say, uh, three hours after that, or say, uh, let's say you want it to run for for, I don't know, 10 hours after that. Then what you do, is you press the uh, the cog setting button here, and the timer will turn to off. So if you want 10 hours, okay, we'll do, I'm actually not, um, yeah, if you want 10 hours, you set it for 10 hours. Actually don't really want it to run for 10 hours, but whatever, I'll just, I'll just, Put it on just for for the purposes of the video. Uh, maybe I'll just run it for five hours. Let's go five hours. Let's go. I don't know. Four hours. Five hours. Let's go. All right. Now, just in case you wanted to check it on time again, so I'm going to come on in point one of an hour. And I'm going to turn off in four hours after that. So I'm basically going to I'm going to run for it for four hours, uh, and then it'll turn off automatically. A lot of people got that bit confused. It is a bit confusing. I don't know why they got rid of the clock. It's just easier to have a clock and then say, "Come on at one o'clock, turn off at two o'clock." I don't know. Whatever. But that's how you do it. And to set that, you then press OK. Now you'll notice there's no clock up here. The times have been set. But we haven't activated the timer. So to activate the timer, you hold these two buttons on top. And now your timer is activated. So in point 0.1 of an hour, my heater will start. Uh, guess I'll see you in point 0.1 of an hour. While we're waiting those six minutes, um, there's one other feature that I did want to mention. Um, to prime the pump, this is something I needed to know because when I first installed the fuel pump, uh, the lines were empty and I needed to prime the lines. Now, I guess other than the first time, you probably won't need to do it, but to prime the lines, you need to hold down the up arrow and the down arrow at the same time and as long as you are holding those those buttons down the pump will prime now I will just do it just momentarily for you I don't really want to prime because um, I'm already primed but I will do it hold it down you should okay you see the fuel pump there you go she's priming now, as I said, I'm already primed, so I don't want to prime too much because she'll flood. Don't want that because the glow plug's not on. But uh, yeah, if you need to prime the lines initially, that's what you would do. It's it's worth knowing because the older ones, you'd press the OK and the down arrow, I believe. That's all the information I found on the internet was OK and down arrow. And that didn't help me a whole lot. Um, yeah, it was actually the two arrow buttons that got the thing priming. Okay. Okay. I just heard that. I just heard it come on. Now, while it's booting up here, I'll go through a few of these symbols. This red one here is the glow plug. So this means that the glow plug is on. This symbol here means it's on. So the, the circle with the stroke through it below was off and this is on. Now the on symbol is represented by a fire in the circle with air blowing over the top of it. You'll notice later on during the cooldown period it has a slightly different symbol. It's the same symbol but no fire in the middle of it. So it's basically it's still on 
uh, but it's not lit and it's cooling down. The air's still blowing over the top to cool it down. Um, you got the fan symbol to notify that the fan is running. The inlet and the exhaust pumps are running. You can see them alternating there. And the fuel pump is going. Now, this knob here represents a knob, a manual knob that you would turn your heater on with. So if you've just got a heater that's got, you know, setting one, two, three, four, five, six, you just turn the knob to whatever setting and that's it. And that's kind of how this works. This is what this is on. This is setting three at the moment. So that, your knob's on one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now I'm gonna set mine to six because I want this thing to heat the hell up quickly. So I'm gonna blast it. Um, the fan does make a bit of noise when you, when you crank it to high. But there is another option. There is another option. You can use the thermostat mode, which if you hold the settings button here for a couple of seconds, it switches over to the thermostat mode. And in the thermostat mode, you can set the temperature that you want it. So if you want it to be 22 degrees, you set it to 22. And the theory is that this is going to blast until this reaches 22. And you can see there is a little thermometer symbol that comes up when you're in the thermostat mode. Um, yeah, look, I can see I can see merits for that, but I I don't know. I think I just per, prefer the, the the good old manual one, two, three, four, five, six version. Um, you could choose. I, uh, I've only really tried the manual version. Um, but uh, you can see I've got this set to level one here, but if you switch over to the thermostat mode, it automatically goes up to level three and in my experience, because this is 22 and we're currently 7, um, this thing will crank right up till it gets to um, the temperature it's at. And that's one of the reasons I like using the manual mode, because if you don't want to make a heap of noise, you can just set it to 1 and um, leave it running for several hours and it'll eventually, bit by bit, get this temperature up. Although, if you want it real hot, real fast, we're going to crank it up to 6. Incidentally, if you go over the top, if you, if you press it more than 6 times, it does show you the um, thermostat display of what you've got it set to, but it doesn't actually allow you to change it. Uh, it just It just gives you a display of what you've got it set to. Uh, if you hold down the OK button, it'll bring up, um, no sorry, you don't have to hold it down, you just press it. It'll bring up the temperature as read by the body, the temperature sensor in the body of the unit. So that'll tell you the temperature inside the unit. And that thing has obviously gotten hot quite quickly. It's up to 150 degrees in there already. I do have it cranked flat out, so uh, no surprises there. You can also scroll through, it'll tell you the voltage. You can see they're running 12 volts at the moment. Obviously there is a voltage drop uh, because this thing's currently flat out. When it starts up, I believe it draws up to 10 amps. And then once it's, um, once it's the glow plugs out which is now if the glow plugs out and you turn the fan down to low it it can run it down to like uh, 0.1 of an amp it's it's very uh, power efficient when it's when it's um, finished heating up it's that initial glow plug that really drains 
the current. And I say really drains 10 amps. It's it's um it's not a huge amount. It's only for a few minutes. All right. Well, um, I think that just about covers most of the basic features of this. Um, I will come back to you once we've warmed up a bit. Incidentally, you may also notice that my timer uh, icon has gone off the screen, so it will not turn off in the four hours that I had planned, but if you press those two top buttons there, you can see the off timer is illuminated, and that will turn off in four hours from now. I don't know why it didn't stay on, maybe it doesn't come on, which is unfortunate if that is the case. But uh, yeah, so you just have to hit the two top buttons to turn that timer on. Got to make sure the little timer is on the screen and that the off function is flashing. That means it will turn itself off in the allocated time. Another thing that's worth mentioning, these bars across the bottom of the unit are literally just that's the temperature that you have set um, so if you've selected six you've got six bars I think in the previous software version it would actually tell you like the bar graphs would go up for the temperature of the internal unit so when this thing got to like 220 odd degrees it would be at, at the top there I think 220 or 230 is like the maximum that these things will do before they'll shut down they will have an over temp shutdown uh, which if they get too hot they will do um, so yeah this this bar graph is just like this thing can be at 200 degrees but if I set it down to level one, it's gonna be one one bar. So that bar is representative of the heat setting, not the actual temperature of the uh, unit, as I believe the old controller was. All right, so I'm here uh, an hour, an hour later. Uh, this thing's been cranking on at level 6 and we're at a toasty 20 degrees according to the display here uh, that's plenty for me I'm actually going to wind it down um, wind it down to level 1 let it sort of just taper off oh, it's just sort of teetering on 21 degrees so yeah um, and then I'll just let it sit at level one the whole thing will sort of spool down get a lot quieter use a lot less fuel as well you can hear it I don't know if you can hear it I can hear it sort of calming down and personally I just like to leave it on at this level just on level one uh, I don't generally crank it all the way up to get to get this warm I usually just turn it on at level one because I find that even at level one it tends to you know just plod along slowly and bring the bring the uh, temperature up slowly and uh, just for what it's worth uh, over here I have set up a probe, temperature probe to go outside. It is still reading five and a half degrees outside, my little temperature probe. So we're plenty warm in here. I'm going to shut it down now and to shut down you hold this button, the power button, for two seconds and it goes off. Now it's going to have to do a shutdown sequence. And you can see 
the power display is not in the off position but it is in the airflow but no fire position so it's going to run the fan you can see also that the glow plug light has lit up uh, and it is still running the fan so it's going to run like a cool down period where it runs the fan over everything and cools everything down runs the glow plug so that it burns any excess uh, fuel off of the the glow plug so that it doesn't foul up and it cools everything down nicely now it's noted that this is an important feature you can't just pull the power and stop everything because otherwise uh, this the the body is at like 200 odd degrees and if you stop the fan I mean it's 200 de degrees with the fan blowing cool air over the top of it so if you stop it immediately the body of the unit can get really hot hot enough to potentially I don't know do damage so make sure you follow the cool down procedure and then when this is finished the little mode the, the indicator will drop to that circle with the cross through it you can see the glow plugs finished now we're still just running the fan to cool the body down all right guys thanks for watching highly highly recommend diesel heater if you're doing any uh winter camping uh caravan or tent or otherwise i love it i love the diesel heater it's great um patches you can buy patches uh to support my channel from my facebook page uh, and you can also buy me a coffee in the link below shout outs to adam hoy and all my coffee supporters um also i'll put a link down to the diesel heater below of course if you want to get yourself one of those um again off brand for my usual kind of videos but um hopefully uh you can enjoy this sort of thing as well i uh i know i do see you on the slopes peace